Sean Johnson joins me this week to discuss brewing porters and stouts. This is Beersmith Podcast number 157. This is Beersmith Podcast number 157 and it's early October 2017. This week, Sean Johnson joins me to discuss brewing stouts and porters. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They're running an amazing deal right now. Get 20% off your subscription when you use the code BEERSMITH2017. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for home brewers and beer lovers. You can read my new column called Ask the Experts there. Take advantage of their special deal when you use the offer code BEERSMITH2017 at beerandbrewing.com. Again, that's beerandbrewing.com. And also the new BrewVision thermometer from Blickman Engineering. This interactive wireless digital thermometer connects right to your iPhone or iPad and lets you remotely monitor and record temperatures. You can download your recipes right from the Beersmith cloud and send updates and alerts as you brew. Get the BrewVision Bluetooth thermometer today. Another great innovation from BlickmanEngineering.com. Again, that's BlickmanEngineering.com. And finally, Beersmith Software, the industry standard for home and professional brewers. It lets you design great beer recipes and brew with confidence. Download your free 21-day trial today at Beersmith.com. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome Sean Johnson. He's the assistant brewer at the Brewing Science Lab at the University of Northern Colorado. He works with Dr. Mosher, teaching a a six-month hands-on certificate program in brewing. Sean has a master's degree in hop chemistry and worked at Anheuser-Busch in the Barley Research Team uh, before he joined UNC. Sean, it is great to have you on the show. It's good to be on the show. So how are things out there in uh, northern Colorado this time of year? Uh, They're doing pretty good. The fall semester is underway and the students are in their chemistry classes and we're just kind of waiting for the spring to start up the program again. Awesome. And, uh, of course, you're a first-time guest. It's uh, great to have you, but um, I understand you want to discuss porters and stouts today. Uh, do you get a chance to brew a lot of porters and stouts? They're actually two of my favorite styles. Oh, yeah, and right now the Oktoberfest style is uh, really popular because of the time of year, but the weather as it gets colder, and here in Colorado it's been in the 60s the past couple of days, that really brings the dark beers into season for me. Yep. And um, are you a fan of English porters and stouts or do you prefer some of the other styles? Um, If it's good, uh, I enjoy it. (laughs) Uh, But the English styles are are probably pretty high up there in terms of the dark beers and what I enjoy. And uh, why don't we start with a little bit about the history of porters? And uh, one time I understand these were pretty, pretty darn popular in England, right? Oh, yeah. So the porter style um, was developed because brown ales and uh, darker ales were really popular in England because of the way they had to kiln the malt. And the wood uh, that they used to wood fire the or heat the kilns with the fire uh, would brown the malt. And over time, that allowed that kind of brown beer, uh, brown ales to appear. And over time, the dock workers uh, who went into the bars after work, one of these, you know, 4% or lower beers that, uh, were nice and brown in color. And, uh, the dock workers were called porters. And so over time, the beer style just kind of grabbed that name as well. Uh, the first time it was ever mentioned, I think was around 1721. Mm -hmm. Um, but pretty much it got its name from, uh, the dock workers that enjoyed the style. And uh, as I understand it, this was before we had coke-fired kiln, so a lot of the a lot of the barley was was dark brown and and also uh, potentially smoked, right? It must have been. Yeah, pretty much. Um, they had to deal with what they you know could work with, and early on they didn't have a way to keep the malt from getting burned when they were kilning it, so it just kind of uh, the style evolved because that was what was available to uh, drink. And uh, stouts, of course, are somewhat related to porters. How how closely related are they historically? Um, Originally, very. uh, As time went on, they kind of split apart. Originally, um, you would go into a bar in England and you would ask 
for a stout porter. So basically the bar would have their normal porter that they served and then the stout porter would have, you know, more of something. It would be more alcohol typically, but it could be more hops or more malt. And um, that's kind of where the idea stout porter came from. And over time, as people kind of developed a flavor for these beers and a palate for these beers, uh, they went in and just wanted the stout as its own thing rather than asking for the stout porter and expecting it to be the same beer but stronger. And uh, this ultimately led to them splitting into two different styles of the porter and the stout. And what are those? Uh, those, you know, how 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 different are they now? Um, now they're pretty different in the way they're brewed. Uh, the stouts get a lot more mouthfeel from different ingredients that you put into them. Um, porters are usually a little easier drinking, a uh, little less uh, alcohol, a little less mouthfeel. Um, more of a drinking beer rather than a sipping beer, which stouts uh, typically tend to lean closer to a sipping beer rather than a, a casual drinking beer, in my opinion. And one of the interesting things you said is that uh, these were fairly light, low, low gravity beers, uh, more like a session beer today, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, the beer culture back in England was very much, you know, similar to how culture is today, that they wanted to, you know, make the most money off the ingredients they had. And uh, unless you were really high up and really royal or in the royalty of uh, one of the kingdoms or something like that, you wanted to stretch your malt and your grain out as far as you could. So you uh, preferred these uh, lighter beers because you could get more of them and you could have them, you know, in the middle of the day and it wouldn't keep you from working in the afternoon or keep you from, you know, enjoying your nights, you would be able to have the beer and still enjoy, you know, yourself. And interestingly, if we take something like the uh, draft version of Guinness today, it's still uh, a very low gravity beer, right? Uh, yeah, it's actually, people tend to think that dark beer means, you know, it's got to be really high alcohol and all of that. And a lot of the microbreweries uh, do do that with their dark beers. But typically, if you're going to do a true to style porter, it's a drinkable beer and it's uh, four to five percent alcohol usually. And uh, as I understand it, we started to see uh, porters and stouts kind of drop pretty rapidly in the 1800s as some of the lighter beers came into play, right? Yeah, so um, the porters dropped out. Surprisingly enough, the stouts didn't so much. But the porters, um, in 1810, they invented the Coke oven, so the new way to kiln the malt. And these new ways to kiln the malt basically kept the malt from getting uh, charred when um, they were being kilned. So this allowed the beer to be clear, uh, golden. And people preferred this because they could see that their beer was clear and clean, and they could see the bubbles, and they really preferred these um, uh, styles of beers as a port opposed to the porters, which, uh, the darkness could conceal some of the, uh, impurities or imperfections that might be in the beer. One of the other things I found interesting when I was doing some historical research, the, um, uh, about the same time glasses started to get cheaper for a long time, particularly in the 1700s, glasses, glass was actually very expensive. And so yeah. <laughs> very few people could afford to drink out of glassware that was clear. Kind of interesting. Yeah, oh. yeah. and that that's awesome. Um, uh, switching over to stouts, uh, stouts actually stuck around during this time because in 1820, John, John, I think it was John Wheeler, invented black patent malt. So uh, people could use black patent malt to still make stouts, and so that style kind of stuck around during that time because the black patent malt that was created uh, was good for stouts, but not so much for porters. It was a little too strong for porters. And um, what are some of the styles of porters and stouts that we would recognize still today? Uh, obviously, some of these have been uh, revamped as, as the craft beer revolutions happened. Um, but what are some of the styles we see today? Um, yeah, there's a lot of revamping. A lot of the dark beers get vanilla and chocolate and things put in them from the craft scene. And uh, nothing against that. Those beers are really good and they're really drinkable. But I always like to go back to the BJCP styles because that's kind of what I... Uh, learned off of when I started sure. home brewing, and so for them now it's the English porter, the American porter, and the Baltic porter, which uh, go up in alcohol in that order. And then uh, on the stout side, um, we've got again sweet stouts, oatmeal stouts, uh, foreign export stouts, American stouts, and uh, imperial stouts. 
And uh, one of the things I always find interesting is Russian Imperial Stout isn't really Russian, is it? Um, no, it was actually made to appease um, like royalty. It was just given that kind of name because the Russians, uh, the Russian nobility really, really enjoyed that style, that really high alcohol, really dark beer. And so it kind of became known f- w- uh, and associated with Russia because the nobility of Russia liked it so much. But I think it uh, kind of came from that foreign export where they were upping the alcohol, upping the hops to kind of uh, keep the beer uh, clean. It could make the journey. It could survive the trip without getting infected. And uh, in Russia, they just stuck to it. They really liked the style. And that's why most people remember Russian Imperial Stouts over most others. And um, walk us through some of the stout styles that, that people, you know, I think most people are familiar with Guinness. A lot of people have right. Guinness and, and some people like it. Some people don't. I, I, I happen to enjoy it. But um, but what are some of the other styles that people might not be that familiar with and, and might also enjoy? Um, it depends really on what you want. So sweet stouts are, are made with lactose. So they're really nice and sweet. And lactose is a milk sugar. So that gives it kind of that really milky, uh, rich flavor. Oatmeal stouts, you use oats or flaked barley or something like that to kind of give it more of that mouth feel. And um, I'm sure most people are familiar or have had a American stout because it's pretty much any stout that you go over the board, you know, over and above what is expected. That's pretty much the American style. And uh, what do you mean by over and above? Just over on um, gravity or, or what? Yeah, American styles are typically known for taking a style and whether it's one or two or all of the characteristics, just kind of upping it a little bit higher. So you make it more hoppy or you make it more malty or you give it more alcohol. But something about it is uh, out of proportion compared to one of the other styles. And it's just kind of beefed up. And that's pretty common with um, American American styles. And don't they tend to be a little bit cleaner than something like in a traditional English stout? Yeah, I think that um, that ends up happening just because of the equipment available here. And when somebody's making that style, uh, they can clean it up and they can kind of be pretty precise with what they want to do. Okay, well, let's uh, let's talk for a minute about brewing, uh, say, uh, a traditional English porter, which is something I enjoy. It you know, has some complexity and depth to it. Mm-hmm. Um, how would you approach the grain bill? So for any style of beer that I'm trying to make from England or from Germany or from, you know, Ireland, I'm going to try to use as many native ingredients from that area as I can. So I'm going to try to use a two row malt that's from a English variety of barley. I'm going to try to use English hops, English yeast um, as much as I can. And then I'm going to try to recreate uh, the water profile and all of that as much as I can use crystal malts and caramel malts, uh, maybe a little bit of chocolate or brown malt, but try to stick away from the really, really heavy like black patent or uh, really roasted barleys and malts that uh, kind of lean towards the stout side. So what kind of uh, proportion might you use for, let's just pick a, a, a robust uh, English English porter, for example. Um, proportion wise, I'd probably do, uh, I don't know as much percentage wise, but if I was doing like a five gallon batch, which is typically what I do on my, my system at home, I'd mm-hmm. use probably somewhere around six and a half, seven pounds of, uh, of two row, probably a pound to two pounds of crystal, depending on the color and the variety. And then I'd probably use half a pound to a pound of brown, maybe less if I'm using chocolate malt, since it's a little bit darker. And, um, you actually like using the dark crystal malts or I, I know they can be somewhat harsh. So can brown malt actually. Yeah. I, I like to use crystal 60. Um, that's kind of my go-to. I really like the flavor that that one provides. I'm, I'm a big fan of the flavors and colors that I get from 60 on my, uh, system when I brew. Yeah. I know when you get to the 80 and above, it starts to get, uh, into what Randy Mosher calls the harsh zone. Um, yeah. and I did an article about that recently, but you know, you kind of that between 80 and I don't know, roughly 200 love a bond. A lot of the malts in there can be quite harsh. 
Yeah, and that's more towards like if I was going to make a coffee porter or something like that, I might use a little bit higher to kind of simulate some more of that, you know, harsh flavor that you would expect to get from coffee. But if I'm just going to try to do a true to style uh, drinkable porter, I'm going to stick with the 60 probably. Have you tried making anything with a large proportion of brown malt? Maybe in the, you know, because brown malt, of course, is what was originally used uh, uh, for the traditional porters. Um, early on when I started home brewing, I tried something like that. I think that it was user error that turned it into a bad beer. <laughs> um, I think that I, uh, fermented it in the summer and it was really hot. So that's the only time I've ever tried to use like a really significant portion of brown malt. I ended up finding a recipe, uh, that used, uh, crystal, uh, 80 and 120 and I readjusted the color with crystal 60 and I've kind of stuck with that recipe because I really enjoy the beer that it produces. And uh, how do you get complexity into the grain bill? I mean, for example, I don't like a single dimensional uh, uh, porter. I like something that has some depth to it. Um, it's, I mean, you can always get complexity by adding, you know, other flavors. You can get, uh, you can have a lot of fun with the dark beers because there's a lot of flavors that work in dark beers that wouldn't in others. So like raisin and plum uh, in small amounts can add some complexity, but also just playing around with the grain bill and playing around with the hop bill. You use, you know, a little bit of crystal 20 and a little bit of crystal 60, or you use a little bit of Maris Otter and a little bit of, you know, Pilsner uh, malt or something like that. Uh, maybe not Pilsner, but you know what, something along those lines to where just kind of play around and mix and match the grain bill and the hop bill, uh, give that some complexity so that it's not all, uh, you know, just one step-by-step ingredient. Mm -hmm. Um, well, let's switch over to stouts. What would a stout grain bill look like in contrast to, uh, to a traditional English porter, say an English stout, for example? Um, so I like to use, uh, just two row of uh, uh, flaked uh, oats or flaked barley and then um, just hops and uh, I'm trying to think of the name off the top of my head I completely lost it uh, not the black patent but the roast three, barley yeah roasted, roasted barley. barley yeah roasted barley um, the really dark gives it that nice coffee flavor and then the oats uh, the flaked oats or the flaked barley give it that nice uh, mouth feel I've tried it with flaked rye before wasn't the biggest fan of that but it still kind of gave it gave it the mouth feel that I was looking for I just didn't necessarily like the right so I mean you're, you're you're giving me basically a recipe for a something like a Guinness right because the, the, yeah. the roasted barley really gives you that coffee strong coffee flavor right yeah, and that's when I drink stouts. I haven't uh, I haven't dove much into uh, milk stouts or sweet stouts using lactose or anything. I stick to the coffee and uh, you know really really charred flavors that uh, you can see in some stouts, and I really like that. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, what about uh, hop varieties? What hop varieties would you recommend? Let's start with the porter. Um, the hops, the flavor of them. That, to me gets lost because of the um, roasting of the barley and the other flavors are there. So I kind of just aim for bitterness from the hops. Um, I don't try to do anything too much. Um, I stick with UK Fuggle, um, East Kent Golding I'll use, uh, and just other hops that'll give me good bitterness without uh, trying to impart too much of a flavor profile on the beer because I don't really want it to compete with that um, nice roasty and caramely flavor that you get from the malt. Yeah, and if you play with something like a Fuggles, you're going to get more of that earthy kind of finish to things instead of you know, kind of messy beer, English beer finish to it instead of, uh, you know, something that's too clean, if you will. Yeah, and I kind of like that earthy, earthy flavor that does come through that you get with the, um, with the Fuggle and with those earthy hops. I think that they fit the style pretty well, in my opinion. I, I like drinking, drinking the beers I make with them. Yeah, I use a lot of East Kent Goldings. Uh, Will Amet is another good one. It's a fun yeah, variant. Yeah, Will Amet. That's uh, a really good so one. Those work well. Um, and then would you do something different for the stouts? Obviously, you need a little more bitterness, probably. Yeah, you need a little bit more. But um, I think the biggest thing is that just because it's a stout doesn't necessarily mean that there's a ton more that you have to counteract with the hops. Um, you're going to get more roastiness from the malt and more mouthfeel from the grain bill. But you're not really going to need to overdo it on hops. You have to be careful not to make like a black IPA when you're trying to make a stout. 
And uh, do you have a guideline for, say, a traditional Guinness or something like that? How much, uh, how much bitterness does it need? I typically, for my dark beers, uh, try to stick in the 20 to 40 IBU range. If I'm going for a nice uh, multi porter, I'll go to 20s. And if it's a stout that I want to be a little um, heavier and a little stronger, I might go up to the 35, 40 IBU range. But I try not to go above 40 uh, for my for my dark beers. Yeah, I would think 40 would be, again, something like something in the style of a Guinness where you have that really sharp, uh, you know, roasted barley flavor that you're trying to offset, right? Yeah. Um, and that's pretty much what, what the goal is, is honestly, if, if you don't like how malty it is, you can try next time to add more hops. If you didn't like how hoppy it was next time, add a little bit less hops or a little more malt and just kind of play around with the style until, uh, it's something that you really like. But you probably wouldn't go that high with a traditional sweet stout or something like that, right? Oh, no, I, I would definitely stay and continue to stick down in the twenties if I wanted to stay on the sweeter side. Yeah. Um, let's see. And, uh, let's talk about, uh, uh, yeast now. Um, do you prefer working <laughs> with traditional, traditional ale yeast or do you like something else? Yeah. Um, again, in the same order as the rest of the ingredients, if I want it to be English style, I want to use English, uh, yeast. If I want to do an Irish stout, I'm going to want to use Irish yeast and so on and so forth. I think that, you know, those yeast are, um, from that region, they were used to brew those beers. So I don't see a reason to deviate from what already, uh, worked. So, uh, do you have a recommended one from, uh, white labs? Why yeast? Oh, I do, but I don't remember it. I, I think it's just called uh, traditional English style yeast. And I forget if it's, it's like two or seven or nine. It's one of the, one of the early ones, but I believe it's just called tradi- traditional English ale yeast. If I'm remembering off the top of my head correctly. Yeah. I think they have an English ale and then there's a, like an English ale two or something like that. Yeah. Place. And I like, yeah. I like using those from white labs. And if I'm remembering right, I think it's zero zero seven, but I could be wrong on that. Okay. Um, well, I know water profiles play an important role, at least in some of these uh, English styles. What uh, what advice do you have as far as water? Um, so the way that we always talk about it um, when we're teaching the students and when we're at the class is water is pretty much m- over 90%, over 95% of what beer is. It's mostly water. So you always have to take water into consideration anytime you're brewing. And so um, for us, it's very important when you're doing those English style um, dark beers to kind of mimic the English style water that they had at the time. And so that's a little bit more alkaline, a little bit higher sulfates. um, And, you know, you want it to be a little bit harder than you would expect, you know, or that you would find at your normal water supply. So are you working with, say, a London profile or, or something different? I mean, Dublin, for example, is much different than London's water profile. Yeah, um, we like to do similar to London. We like to do uh, right around the 100 part per million calcium level. Um, We like around 250-ish of the carbonate. Uh, And then sulfates will get 50 to 100. We try to stay in that range. So that's, uh, you know, fairly moderate water. It's not over the top like... uh, Oh, you don't... It's not Burton on Trent or anything like that, yeah. Yeah, you definitely don't want Burton on Trent IPA, uh, super bitter uh, water. You just want it to be, you know, hard enough to where it'll give you that healthiness in your uh, malt enzymes and your yeast, but you don't want to overdo it for sure. And do you uh, treat your mash water as well? Are you worried about mash pH, those kinds of things? Um, if we can get the mash pH to 5.2-ish, that's that's um, what we're aiming for, and usually we can get that by adding the carbonates and things like that. It's usually right around that. Um, I think it's five point two around is what we shoot for. Yeah, it's easier with a darker beer. Obviously, you get more uh, ac- ac- acidity from the malt itself, right? Yeah, the um, kilning does a good job of adding that acidity to the uh, malt, and that transfers over in the mash for sure. And we talked a little bit about this earlier, but, um, you know, flavor complexity is something that comes just not from, not just from the malt build, but, uh, uh, throughout the process. What, um, what advice do you have to get sort of this instead of the American Porter, you know, which might be a lot cleaner or something like that. What advice do you have for getting, 
some of the complexity and depth into uh, a traditional porter or stout? Um, I, I think that it's a really good idea to make sure that you're doing things true to style. Uh, find a solid base that you can work with, tweak it around a little bit to make it your own. But I would recommend, um, you know, sticking with the basics, do an English two row, do some crystal malts and then, uh, stick with English hops and English yeast. Mm -hmm. And any other, any other advice in terms of, uh, grain bills or anything? Um, Honestly, I've always been a believer of kind of make it your own. I've, uh, for my grain bills, when I first started homebrewing, I always went and found something online. Uh, then I went to the local homebrew shop and they wouldn't have everything. So I kind of mixed and matched and made it my own. And uh, I think that that's just the best way to get your own style and get the complexity and get the beers that you want is to just play around and tweak little things at a time, you know, use you know, EKG one week and then use Willamette the next. And then uh, if you don't like the difference between those, go back to what you like and tweak something else and, you know, just kind of slowly work your way into a beer that's yours. Okay. And we spent quite a bit of time talking about the English styles. Um, maybe let's say a few words about the American uh, variations of stout and porter. Yeah, the American variations, I mean, they do a lot of good things, A lot, especially when you go to a lot of the craft breweries. They do a good job of making a stout that's really malty, and they uh, add, you know, a lot of them add these really awesome flavors to it. We have a brewery here in Greeley that just made a cinnamon and chocolate stout that's 10% that's absolutely, you know, amazing to drink. And it's all those complexities. They, you know, shot the alcohol way up. And because of that, um, they were able to add those other flavors and the alcohol kind of counterbalances those harsh cinnamon and chocolatey notes. And it actually blends together to make a really, really nice beer. And uh, I know a lot of uh, American breweries are playing with hops, of course. Uh, I've had some good ones for good porters made with Centennial, for example. Um, have you played around at all with the Northwestern varieties of hops? Um. I, I mean, I've used some. I, I don't know. Is Magnum Northwestern? I've used Magnum before. Uh, it's, a, it's a high alpha hop, if I remember. Yeah, it's a very high alpha. So I've used Magnum before to try to do um, really high bitterness without getting very much flavoring so that I can get a lot of those like uh, malty and, uh, you know, caramely flavors to come through of the beers. But in terms of playing around with hops, I typically stick to the the – uh, you know, safe ones that everybody uses. I, I'm not a huge hop experimenter in dark styles. I'll go out of my way to experiment when I'm doing an IPA and stuff like that because I'm interested in finding the flavors and the aromas that you get from all these different hop styles. But in terms of my darker beers, I usually stick to the standards. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was wondering if you had any thoughts since you were on the topic of IPAs. Uh, of course, there's a huge amount, a huge trend, particularly on the West Coast to uh, to push a lot of these uh, dark IPAs uh, sort of to extremes. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so the dark IPAs are, are definitely a big deal. And it's surprising. I've had a few that are really good. And I've had a few that um, pretty much just taste like a normal IPA. If they do it right, um, there is a nice balance you can get between the bitterness that you can get from uh, making it an IPA and the roastiness of the malt and all of that coming together can make a very beautiful and complex beer. But a lot of people just try to make a traditional IPA or double IPA and just use roasted uh, malt in its place. And I haven't uh, tried to make one myself, but it seems to be an art that some people have mastered and other people are still getting the hang of. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. Uh, I'm trying to think of any other styles we didn't cover. We didn't cover, uh, uh, we didn't talk much about the sweet stouts, uh, and, uh, Baltic porters. I was wondering if you had, uh, any advice for brewing, say a Baltic porter. Um, a Baltic porter, I, I mean, you just kind of use more base malt. You can add a little bit of sugar in the boil kettle if you want to, uh, up the alcohol like a Baltic porter without, um, affecting the, mash bill or grain bill too much or the roastiness too much um it's pretty much just you know stick with your original plan uh 
get some more base malt to up the alcohol and uh, try to not let the alcohol overwhelm the rest of the beer. And if you brew a Baltic Porter where the alcohol is really overwhelming, try to counteract it with some more crystal or maybe a little bit more hops or something like that to kind of balance that out. And uh, you keep mentioning a lot of crystal. I actually have stopped using as much crystal in uh, in a lot of my beers because sometimes I, I get sort of off flavors from it. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Um. I haven't run into that issue personally. We uh, here in Northern Colorado are lucky to have a lot of very local uh, maltsters and uh, barley growers and stuff like that. So a lot of our stuff is very fresh and very well done. And, you know, we're right close to Fort Collins and Loveland and uh, Denver. So the craft beer scene here is huge. And I think because of that, a lot of the maltsters here take a lot of pride in their small business malting. Mm -hmm. And that seems to help a lot with the crystals that we're able to obtain and use it. I haven't noticed any off flavors from it. And then uh, last, I want to mention sort of the equivalent of a Baltic porter, perhaps would be a Russian Imperial stout. And uh, the key again is seems to be balancing the, 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 the alcohol with all the other flavors, right? Uh, yeah, with the Imperial stouts, the Russian Imperial specifically, it's, it's pretty in style to be able to taste the alcohol, especially when it gets that high. So if, if you're trying to make a, like a Imperial stout and you don't taste the alcohol, I would think that you want to scale back on uh, some of your hops or some of your malt at that point because that style should be a sipping beer. It should be a beer that's really strong in alcohol along with the other flavors with that alcohol burn, but definitely you should be tasting it in that. So it's all kind of over the top, right? Oh, yeah. It's it's over the top while not uh, going crazy on hop profile or maltiness. It's a nice beer that you drink and it kind of reminds you of uh, you know, winter and warms you, warms you from the inside. Yeah. I've been, uh, toying with the recipes, trying to develop one here. I want to, my, my goal is I, I made a, a mead, a sweet, straight sweet mead that was a little too sweet. And so what I was planning to do is brew a Russian Imperial stout this winter and then blend the two and make a, uh, Russian Imperial braggot, if you will. So that sounds, uh, like it could be absolutely amazing. <laughs> yeah. I've had, uh, uh, Moonlight Meadery, um, uh, Michael Fairbrother, uh, made, made one that was absolutely fantastic. I think it took him seven years to make it, but, uh, Only seven? It, was, it was out of this world. Yeah. So I've got this, uh, five gallons of mead sitting here waiting, waiting for the Russian Imperial stout to be brewed. Um, yeah. And I mean, that could definitely, the sweetness of that mead and, uh, the high alcohol should definitely complement that beer, beer pretty well, I would think. Yeah. I just got to make sure I make it over the top enough to offset the super sweet mead. Like I said. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you could, I'm, I'm hoping a Russian Imperial stout can help offset that sweetness. If it can't, I don't know very many beers that could. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Well, I wondered if you had any final tips on, uh, porters or stouts. Um, I think that with most beer styles, there's such an awesome community around craft beer and there's so many awesome websites you can use, uh, as references. If, if you have any questions about anything that you're doing, or you can put your recipe online, people will flock to give you advice and tell you what they've done in its place, or if they've done something similar and what they noticed from these beers. And I think that um, the online community around the craft beer scene and the homebrew scene is just really a wonderful resource to have. Absolutely. I, uh, I, I've gotten to where I just, you know, basically go online and start looking for, uh, for sample recipes and then kind of, uh, kind of pull from those a lot of times when I'm trying to do something new. Yeah, I think that that's a great way to do it. That's how I do most of my recipes anymore because, you know, there's no reason to try to reinvent the wheel. Um, if people have produced these great beers, why not take the beer and take the base of it and tweak it a little bit, make it your own. But if it's already great, I wouldn't, you know, try to do too much to it. Um, well, I wanted to take a minute here at the end and give you an opportunity to talk about the uh, program you have going on at the University of Colorado uh, brewing program. I, I think you said it's a six month uh, brewing certificate program. Yeah. So at the University of Northern Colorado, we have a six month program where the first uh, semester of it is in the spring and that's all online. You can do that from anywhere. It's all online. After that, we have two courses in the summer um, that are three weeks long each. They meet from Monday to Friday, eight to five. 
the first class you work in the chemistry laboratories at UNC and you will do ASBC methods. We do over 30 quality control methods on beer from grain to beer. We cover everything. And then after that course, we have a three week course that meets at the brewery we have on campus, which is a seven barrel uh, steam fired system that the students get hands on experience. Uh, they get to work in the brew house. They brew three batches of beer during that time. And uh, it's a really awesome place for them to uh, learn how to work on the equipment. And uh, can you talk a little about the ASBC methods? Because a lot of homebrewers may not be familiar with that stuff. Yeah, so that's the American Society of Brewing Chemists. And basically, they've uh, since the 80s, they've had this huge booklet that's uh, always expanding of different ways to test for you know, different parameters in your beer to make sure that the beer you brew on Monday and the beer you brew on Friday are the exact same beer. And so we go over analyses on how to test your grain to make sure your grain is the same every time, how to test your wort to make sure your wort is the same, the bitterness from your hops, because uh, hops, like other plants, they can vary from season to season. So you need to know the bitterness, exactly what you're getting out of those hops so that you know exactly how much to put in your beers so that they're not, you know, varying from one batch to the next. That's awesome. Yeah, I started, um, I was playing the other day with some of the ASBC. Uh, they've put out a new standard for for doing sensory perception on malts. I don't know, you've probably seen that, I'm sure. Yeah, we we are actually in the process. We're um, going through trying to improve how much sensory we can provide. Uh, right now, we do a little bit with the kits from the Siebel Institute and do some training in in that sense. But we're trying to put together some more sensory stuff to help people out in that field. Is that the uh, off-flavor kits that they put out? Yeah, it's just the ones that you can get on their website. Yeah, I've been using those at, uh, actually, the Brew Your Own event. I usually, we, we go through those and, uh, and do a sensory evaluation with the team there. It's kind of fun. Um, let's see, I wanted to ask, uh, where can you find out more about the program? I'll throw up the website, but uh, maybe you can tell people where to go. Yeah, so you can go to the website, which is extended.unco.edu slash brewing, or you can just email brewing at unco.edu. We're also on social media at UNCO Brewing. Great, Sean. Uh, well, is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, thank you for having me on the show. It was great talking about porters and stouts. Uh, had a lot of fun. And if you ever want to know some chemistry of beer stuff, I'd be happy to come back. Well, thank you, Sean. I appreciate it. It's uh, It's been great having you on the show as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and again, my guest today was Sean Johnson. Sean is assistant brewer at the University of Northern Colorado's, uh, Northern Colorado's Brewing Certificate Program. Uh, he also has a master's degree in hop chemistry. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Well, a big thank you to Sean Johnson for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue is packed with great information for home brewers and craft beer fans. Take advantage of their special sale and get 20% off when you use the offer code BEERSMITH2017 at beerandbrewing.com. And also Blickman Engineering, creators of the innovative new BrewVision wireless thermometer. Remotely monitor your brewing system from your iPhone or iPad, record data, set alerts, and grab recipes directly from the BeerSmith cloud. The BrewVision thermometer, another great innovation from BlickmanEngineering.com. And BeerSmith software, the industry standard for home and professional brewers that lets you design great beer recipes and brew with confidence. Download your free 21-day trial today from BeerSmith.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you have a great brewing week. Thank you.